Hi, my name is Dr. Alex Thompson and I'm a marine biogeochemist and ecologist. I also work with startups and small businesses to make their industries a little bit more sustainable by helping them to develop new tools and resources to green up what they're working on. Now explaining to someone what a marine biogeochemist and ecologist does can sometimes be a little bit confusing. I don't swim with dolphins, I don't swim with whales, and although I love to track turtles, it's just not something that we do. Instead, we look at how our global systems respond to change and how things in the mud and in our trees and our plants are able to capture different things like carbon and release things like gases. Trying to help people understand how their interactions can affect these different systems is sometimes also a little bit confusing. So I'm gonna invite you to close your eyes and just imagine something. Imagine that you're at a barbecue, the sun's out, the barbecue's sizzling, someone's made a pavlova, everything's great. You hear the magic words called, food's ready. So you line up by the barbecue, all excited to get your sausage sandwich, vegan or meat, whatever it is that you choose. You get handed a plastic plate, you get given some bread, you get a sausage, you sit in the sun and life is good. After about 20 to 120 seconds, depending on how fast you eat your sausage sandwich, you take your plastic plate and you pop it in the bin. Not much thought is put to that process other than, man, that sausage was great. However, what we're not considering is that for you to eat that sausage sandwich off that plastic plate has literally taken billions of years of evolutionary processes to create the components that are essential for that plastic inside that plate. Now you might be thinking, that sounds a bit extreme. Billions of years for a plastic plate? Well, let me just kind of talk that through for you. So our planet was formed about 4.54 billion years ago. And for a good portion of those initial years, it was a big, hot, gassy soup. Not a particularly pleasant place to live. Certainly not a place that you and I could live. And for a very long time, not a place that literally anything could live. About two and a half to three billion years ago, we started seeing some organisms appear that worked out that they could turn this process of all these gases that kind of appeared on Earth, suck them up and with some sunlight start producing oxygen. These organisms were cyanobacteria and they're the ancestors of microalgae that we still have on planet Earth today. So all this time, about two and a half billion years ago, these tiny cyanobacteria were sucking up carbon from our ancient atmospheres, producing oxygen at such a rate that they were actually able to produce Earth's atmosphere as we know it today. They produced so much oxygen that all life on Earth was able to evolve and over time we started seeing like plants and animals, dinosaurs, all the way to humans, you and I, appear on Earth. All because these tiny organisms were able to suck carbon from our atmosphere and convert it into enough oxygen to produce a livable atmosphere. So, again, what has this got to do with your plastic plate? Well, these tiny organisms, these tiny ancestral algae, were so good at sucking carbon from the atmosphere that over time, as they died, they became compressed and squished under the Earth's surface. This happened again and again and again over billions and billions of years until the point that they got into this big kind of soupy stuff underneath that Earth's surface. Mixed in with things like dinosaur bones and bits of plants, this is now what we call our fossil fuel reserves. We see today that we then use these fossil fuel reserves, these ancient bits of dead algae and carbon from our ancient atmospheres, and turn it into things like fuel and even plastics. So what we see is these ancient cells get sucked up onto our Earth's surface, converted into things that you and I can use, sometimes for a very short period of time, like they're eating a sausage sandwich, and then they get disposed where, again, over time, they might be shredded, degraded, and turned back into carbon dioxide that's returned to the atmosphere. So what happens to this carbon that was captured by these algae cells all these billions of years ago? Well, once you're done eating your sausage sandwich off your plate and you've disposed of that plastic plate, over time, that plastic becomes shredded and breaks down. Depending on what type of plastic it is, this process may take a number of weeks or hundreds of years. That ancient carbon that was captured by algae all those billions of years ago, turned into fossil fuel reserves, extracted and processed and turned into a plastic plate, then essentially returns back to the atmosphere where it's starting to contribute to climate change because additional carbon dioxide is put back into the atmosphere, making it as unlivable as it was all those billions of years ago. That's a pretty big feat and a pretty big journey for a tiny, tiny little cell to make. But 
we have to go back to this idea of carbon. And we could sometimes think of carbon as a pretty dirty word. But actually, carbon isn't dirty at all. Although it makes up a lot of dirt, it's also a really essential element that makes up things like you and I, cars, computers, plants, tree trunks, and the food that we eat. In fact, everything organic on this planet uses carbon as an essential building block. There's nothing bad about carbon except it's just one of those things that if it's in the wrong place and it's too much in a wrong place, then it can cause some pretty big problems. As we know, a lot of the drivers of global climate change is too much carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And just like our plastic plates, if we have carbon in the wrong place, it can cause some pretty big problems. So let me backtrack a little bit. How do we get plants to actually capture and store carbon? And how do these ancient algae cells get so good at capturing carbon from our atmosphere and helping it turn into a livable atmosphere? Well, like you and I, plants and anything that photosynthesize essentially breathe, except instead of breathing in oxygen like you and I do, they breathe in carbon dioxide. They don't need the oxygen, so they put that back out so we can actually breathe and it forms a livable atmosphere. And the carbon that they're able to capture is incorporated in its leaves, its roots. If it has a trunk, it's incorporated in its trunk. And over time, as that plant or that tiny microscopic photosynthetic cell grows, the carbon stays within its body. Then, as that plant or cell dies, the carbon stays within that bit of leaf or that bit of twig or that bit of trunk. And over time, as it falls to maybe the seabed, maybe the forest floor, maybe a bottom of a lake, it becomes compressed over time with bits of sediment and dirt. And over time, that becomes what we call a stored carbon pool. This is really great because it means that we're able to store carbon in different places across the Earth. And photosynthesis is one of the most efficient ways that we can pull carbon from our atmosphere. Although we think that carbon can cause a lot of damage and, you know, on the other side makes up comp essential components of all life on Earth, carbon is also a really delicate thing. When I was researching carbon in North Sydney in a seagrass meadow a few years ago, we found a seagrass meadow that had been performing this process, this sucking up carbon from the atmosphere, incorporating its leaves, the leaves are falling down, they're creating this big muddy kind of composite of carbon stock over time for over 5,000 years. That seagrass meadow had been sitting there for longer than you or I will ever exist on this earth and had been performing this process for so long that it held such a rich carbon stock that it could potentially offset numerous people's activities. However, when we came back to the site a few months later, this meadow had been dug up and all that carbon potentially lost, meaning that carbon that had been sitting there for up to 5,000 years potentially returned back to the atmosphere, going against what we're trying to do, which is to mitigate climate change. So how do we look back at these processes, the problems that have been going on for billions of years, capturing carbon from our atmosphere with algae and cyanobacteria, using seagrasses to capture carbon and store it for so long, and help us to understand how these processes can help us build a greener future? Well, the processes that we're trying to change now are very similar to the processes that existed all those billions of years ago. We're trying to capture carbon from our atmosphere and store it for really long times. And we're also trying to make products and things that you and I need to live more sustainable so that we can continue using them in the future. What if there was a way that we can start to use these different technologies, these photosynthesis and the ability of algae to produce oils to develop new products and help us to capture more carbon in the making? Well, in laboratories and research centers across the world, this is exactly what's happening. We're harnessing these tiny organisms, these microalgae, seaweeds, and seagrasses to develop new products and ways of capturing carbon from our atmosphere to help us both mitigate climate change, but to also develop new tools and resources to make industries more green. You might be thinking, how is this possible? Well, you might remember that I was talking about how microalgae cells are essentially what our fossil fuels are made up of. And that's because they're so good at producing oil that they can produce massive reservoirs of it. If we're to grow this microalgae on the surface of our earth, we can extract the oil and make very similar products to what you and I need fossil fuels to make today. Things like plastics and biodegradable foams, compostable uh, resources, and things like clothing can be made out of these products. I want to end this by saying that we as a global community have a destination that we need to reach in terms of sustainability and mitigating climate change. Plants, algae, and photosynthesis are just one of the vehicles that we can use to reach this destination, but there are many other vehicles out there that can help us get to the same place. If I was to ask you one thing, it would be to go out there and find what these are.
Across the world, there's many different technologies, evolutionary processes, and reservoirs of knowledge that are out there that can help us get there. But it's going to take your support, investment, and engagement to really get these things going. If I was to ask you one thing, go out there and find which ones to support, and don't forget about the plastic plate. Thanks, I'm Alex Thompson.